Get ready to find the keys to living the life you always wanted to live. Reverend Steve James and his special guest of top spiritual men and women will share powerful keys to living the life that Jesus Christ came to make available. All righty. Well, God bless you all in the wonderful name of our risen Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. And this morning, we're going to get into the topic of how the Bible interprets itself. This is our Bible. We have Bibles in our hands, some of them electronic, some of them the old-fashioned paper and book cover and stuff. But this is what we're going to learn that can work on all Bible types is how the Bible interprets itself. And to get started with this, I'd like to look at 2 Peter chapter 1. And in chapter 1, in verse 20, it says, Knowing this first. See, ordinarily, this would probably be the first thing that you would teach, right? It says, knowing this first. This is the first thing you should know. Knowing this first, that no prophecy of the Scripture is, is of any private interpretation. Now, that word private is the Greek word idios. And the meaning of the word idios means one's own or his own. This is the only place that it's translated private. But I can see how they could come up with the word private because if it's your own, it's your own private business, right? Your own business. So that's how they came up with that word. But it really is one's own. One's own. And other translations of the Bible have it in other ways. This here is the King James that I read from, but in the New American Standard Bible, it reads like this. But know this first of all, that no prophecy of the scripture is a matter of one's own interpretation. Now that's pretty interesting, because what that means is, I can't have my interpretation of the Bible, and you can't have your interpretation of the Bible. And if you were a denomination, you can't say, well, it's, this is my denominational interpretation of the Bible. It says that there is no private interpretation or one's own, or one's own club, group, or organization. So that must mean that the Bible means what it says and says what it means without any private or one's own interpretation. I'd like to go to Matthew chapter 9 to show you this, show you the word idios. In Matthew chapter 9 and in verse 1, it says, And he entered into a ship and passed over and came unto his own city. See, that own was idios, the Greek word idios, meaning his own city. And while we're in Matthew, go to chapter 25. Just showing you a couple places where the word idios is used. And in verse 14, 25, 14, and it says, For the kingdom of heaven is as a man traveling in a far country, who called his own servants and delivered unto them his good. It's the word own there. See a man traveling into a, a far country who called his own servants. They were his servants. See that? And what it's saying in uh, Peter is that you cannot have your own interpretation. And that's what people do sometimes. They'll say, well, what's your interpretation? They'll ask me. They go, Steve, what's your interpretation of this? But I always say, well, I don't have an interpretation, but the Bible says this. Pretty neat, huh? I'd like to go to 1 Corinthians now. 1 Corinthians chapter 12, verse 11. And this one will come up later in our study of God's Word. You'll, I'll show you why. In 11 it says, But all these work at that one and the selfsame Spirit, dividing to every man severally as he wills. And the the Greek word, idios, is the word, can you tell? Severally, severally, as he wills. Divide into every man 
his own as he wills would be a better translation. And this, this comes, you know, significant later in our studies when we get into the field of the Holy Spirit. Then this verse will make more sense knowing that the Spirit, that self-same Spirit divides to every man his own as he wills, which makes it very interesting and easy to interpret and understand. Now let's go back to 2 Peter chapter 1, verse 20, right where we were. And I want to look at this in a little bit more detail. Because this verse is the first thing we should know. We should really understand this when it comes to interpreting the Bible, right? And it says, knowing this first, that no prophecy of the Scripture is of any private interpretation. Now that word interpretation in the Greek is the Greek word ellipsis. And this is the only place where the word is used in the Bible, so you can't do a word study on it. But in Greek writings, the word is used like a dog loose upon the game. And knowing this first, that no prophecy of the scripture is of any personal letting loose. You know, you just can't let loose with your mind. Well, I think it means this. That's not what we're supposed to do when it comes to interpreting the word of God. So, if there is no private interpretation, if there is none, what's left? Well, there's only two things really left. One is, there is no interpretation available. If there is no pr private, then there's just none left. Or there's another one that I like and I believe, and that is that the Bible interprets itself. It says what it means, where it says it, to whom it says it, why it says it, how it says it, all those things. The Bible means what it says. And we're not to let us have an explosion of ideas and thinking, reading into the Word of God. We let the Word of God speak for itself. And you know, to help us do this, you know what we use? We use the rules and laws of grammar. Same ones you learned in grammar school. To help us let the Word of God interpret itself. We use the rules of grammar. Now words have meanings and we need to let the words in the verses speak for themselves. And I want to look at a couple examples of this so you can see how easy it is to let the Word speak for itself. Let's go to the very first chapter in the very first book of the Bible, Genesis, chapter 1, verse 1. So you're sitting down and you're going to read God's Word and you pick up the Bible, you go to the very first page in the Bible and you start reading and it says, in the beginning God created the heaven and the earth. Do you understand all those words in that verse? Yes. You understand in the beginning, right? God created the heaven and the earth. So it interprets itself right where it's written. And you don't need a, a document on what each word means and how it works. It's, they're simply stated and you know exactly how it works. So it interprets itself right in the beginning. <laughs> in the beginning, God created the heaven and the earth. So in, when's that? In the beginning. Who created it? God. What did he create? The heaven and the earth. It's very self-explanatory. The word interprets itself right there, right in the verse. I want to show you another one. Go to John chapter 3. The Gospel of John chapter 3, verse 16. And I'm going to these ones because these are ones that everyone reads and knows. These aren't hidden away somewhere. They're ones that people speak all the time. This one you can see at football games in the stands all over the place. 316 and it says, For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten Son, that whosoever believeth in him should not perish but have everlasting life. 
Do you understand the words in this verse? You don't need a commentator to tell you anything. You don't even really need a dictionary, right? We all know these words. For, I understand. For God, yeah, so loved the world. Okay, I understand. That he gave his only begotten Son, yeah, I understand all those words. That whosoever believeth in him should not perish, but have everlasting life. Now, some people say that the Bible's hard to understand. Are these words hard to understand? No. The Bible interprets itself right in the verse. And I've heard some Bible scholars say that, that like 90% of the Bible interprets itself right in the verse. Right where you read it. So it's easy for the Bible to interpret itself. I'm trying to demonstrate that here to you. Go to Matthew chapter 11. We're going to look at another one of these. Matthew chapter 11, verse 28. And as you read it, it says, Come unto me, all ye that labor and are heavy laden, and I will give you rest. So we understand those words, right? We understand the words in the verse, so it interprets itself right in the verse, which is pretty neat. It's, it's just wonderful how the word interprets itself. But you know what? Let's read a couple more verses. Take my yoke upon you and learn of me. For I am meek and lowly in heart, and ye shall find rest unto your soul. For my yoke is easy and my burden is light. We understand all those words, right? We understand the words. They have meanings, and we can put it together, which is pretty neat. So it interprets itself right in the verse, right where it's written. Each word has a meaning. We understand the meaning of the word, and then we know what it, the interpretation is. It's self-explanatory. Pretty neat. But if you add other verses, chapters, or even the entire book, that the idea or word or words are written in, you can get a more complete story or record. And that is called in the context. By reading all three of these verses, we have more of the context, right? The more complete the context that you read, the more complete understanding that you can have. Like what, as you read all three of these, you have a more complete understanding. That's why I exhort Bible students to read their Bibles much so they can get the entire context. You know, in grammar school, when a person has a hard time with a word or a group of words, one of the ways that they learn the meaning is by reading the context or the story around it. Then they get an understanding of the words. The Bible works just like that. The, to understand the Bible and to f let the Bible speak for itself and have its own interpretation, we have to read the Bible and the words will speak for themselves. This is a very important key to understanding. It is to read the entire context and get the complete story or record. And this can mean sometimes reading the entire book that the verses or what you're looking at means. To get the complete story. And if you do not understand something or want to know more about one subject, one way to learn is by reading the entire context. That's how we get the entire story and record from the Bible. It's because the Bible interprets itself in the context, in the story, the whole record. This is how students learn what a new word means in the passage that they're reading. That's what a Bible researcher does. Now I want to show you one and how this works right in the context. I want you to go to Matthew, which we are in now, and go to chapter 13. And I'll show you how this works and how sometimes people get into problems when they're reading God's Word. Okay, here we go. We're going to start in verse 24. And it says, Another parable put he forth unto them. 
Now this is Jesus Christ, and he's reading another parable unto them, saying, The kingdom of heaven is likened unto a man which soweth good seed in his field. And then I say, so what's the good seed? Right? I'm in a Sunday school class, you know. I go, okay, what's the good seed? Well, this girl says, well, I think good seed is Jesus Christ. He's the good seed. This boy over here goes, I think the good seed is the good deeds that we do on earth to help people and how we can be real friendly to people. Uh, I think the good seed is the Word of God that is made available for people. So what do we have here? Well, we have three denominations. We have three thoughts of what the Word says. You know what they did? They guessed. What do you think it means? It was a guess. I think this. I, and the three people thought different things. Well, you know what we need to do? We need to quit thinking and guessing. We need to read the whole re story, the whole record. We need to keep on reading until someplace, somewhere, sometime, the meaning is explained. And if it's not explained, we will never know. That's how the Word of God is. We don't guess and try to make the Word say something because of our great understanding. We let the Word speak for itself. So let's read the, the whole context and see if we can find out what the good seed is. Verse 25 says, But while men slept, his enemies came and sowed tares among the wheat, and went his way. But when the blade was sprung up, and brought forth fruit, there appeared the tares also. So the servants of the household came and said unto him, Sir, dost not thou sow good seed in the field? From, from whence then has it the tares? Where do these tares come from? And he said unto them, An enemy has done this. And the servants said unto him, Will thou then that we go and gather them up? But he said, Nope. Lest while we gather up the tares, ye root up also the wheat with them. Let them both grow together until the harvest. And in the time of harvest, I will say unto the reapers, Gather ye together first the tares, and bind them in bundles, and burn them. But gather the wheat into my barn. And in verse 31, another parable put he forth unto them. Did he ever tell you what the good seed is? No. You know what? You don't know. He didn't tell you. If he doesn't tell you, you don't know. We have to keep reading. If you're ever going to know what the good seed is, you have to keep reading the Bible. That's why I say read much of the Bible. That's how you'll get to know the score and the answers. And you can keep reading for a long time, and it, he never tells you. But I'd like to go down to verse 36. He speaks another parable like I told you. Then in verse 36 it says, And then Jesus sent the multitude away, and went into a house, and his disciples and came unto him, saying, Declare unto us the parable of the tares of the field. See, his disciples were smart already. They knew not to guess. So they said, Jesus, what was the meaning of this parable? What was I we didn't get it? In verse thirty seven it says, And he answered and said unto them, he that soweth the good seed is the Son of Man. Can you get it any plainer? The guy that sowed it was the Son of Man. The field is world. The seed, the good seed, are the children of the kingdom. So what's the good seed? The children of the kingdom is what it says, right? We didn't have to guess. It said it plain as can be. In our scenario, all three of them were wrong. All three of them were wrong, but in God's word, we know exactly what it is. 
And this parable is interesting because he's really telling what's, what happens at the end of the world. But the tares of the children of the wicked, the ones that grow up and smother them, right? The enemy that sowed them is the devil. Can you get it any plainer? The harvest is the end of the world. See, that's how you know it's the end of the world. And the reapers are the what? Angels. Angels. It says, as therefore the tares are gathered and burnt in, in the fire, so shall it be at the end of the world. And the Son of Man shall send forth his angels, and they shall gather out of his kingdom all things that offend, and them which do iniquity. And in verse 42 it says, And shall cast them into a furnace of fire, and there shall be wailing and gnashing of teeth. He gives the answer right in God's word. So that's why I say the word of God interprets itself right in the verse or in the context, the whole story, as you continue to read. That's why Bible students are really Bible readers. They read lots of the scripture, lots of the word of God. I'd like to read a little section from my book on how to read the Bible for understanding and power that deals with this subject. And it deals with the subject in Acts chapter, chapter 7, verse 55 and 56. So you could turn there, but I'm, I'm going to read from my book right now. And it, this is an excerpt from my book, and it says, I would like to tell you a story. I had a friend who told me this story. He was a young man who had started to run a fellowship in his home, and he had been reading and searching God's Word for a short time. But he was not the guessing type. He would read and search God's Word, and then he would teach it in his home to others who came by to hear him. And one day as he was teaching in his home, another young man came to his fellowship. This other young man had been going to churches his whole life and was the head of almost every church group at his college that he was attending. He was really well-versed in the religion. And he heard about this little fellowship being run near his college, and he was interested, and he went to the Bible Fellowship. And as he was sitting there in the front row, my friend who was teaching God's Word came to this verse here in chapter, in Acts chapter 7, verse 55, and it says, And said, Behold, I see the heavens open, and the Son of Man standing on the right hand of God. And then, looking right at the young man, he said, Why was the Son of Man standing? And the young leader of almost every religious group on campus, a little startled and embarrassed, said, I don't know. And my friend said, That's right. If the Word of God doesn't tell you, then you don't know. Well, that young uh, student leader was so surprised to not know the answer and still be right. Because if God doesn't tell you, you don't know. There's nothing wrong with saying that you do not know when you don't know. To guess is always wrong. Instead of guessing, we need to learn how to read our Bible and how to search the Scriptures to see what the Word of God says. I will tell you another story or another thing that I see from time to time. It says in God's Word that God knows before we pray what things we have need of. It also says to pray. God asked us to pray. Why? This is a question that I hear all the time. Why do we have to pray to God when God knows what we have need of before we ask? Do you know what the answer is? I do not know. God says to pray, and that's all I know. I don't try to guess. 
I don't try to make something up. I don't try to use my best working knowledge of what I think it might be. I just say, I don't know. That's honest. This has been the problem. Too much speculation. Too much guessing. We need to let the word interpret itself. We need to search the scriptures and to say what the scriptures say without embellishing them with our opinions. We need to let the word say what they say without adding misleading terms. We need to consider the exact words that are written in each verse and to consider those v words in their context. We may need to read the entire book in which the record is written in to get the complete context. Some people who have some knowledge of God's word have been asked questions and not wanting to look intelligent or to look smart have said, I think it means this. We should try very hard never to use the words, I think it means. I don't mind saying, I don't know. Because the word of God interprets itself right in the verse or in the context and some other keys that we will look at as we meet and continue next time. Well, dear God, thank you for your word that you've given, made available for us to be able to read and to understand so that we could know you, God to know your son, and to know us, and how to tap into the resources for the more abundant life. So God, I thank you for the keys on how the Bible interprets itself, and I thank you that we can learn them and utilize them in our lives to be more than conquerors in every situation. Well, God bless. We'll see you next time. The episode is complete, so head over to stevejanes.com for show notes. While there, sign up for our newsletter, grab the freebies, and check out all that Reverend Steve Janes has available. Steve has plenty to give, audio and video teachings, articles, blogs, and biblical study books, all there to help you continue to grow in God's grace and in the knowledge of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. All keys to help you live the life you've always wanted to live.